Hey everybody, Danielle Hargan Raider here and welcome to another episode of Unleash Your Inner Diabetes Dominator. Today I'm very excited to bring you another person who is living happy and healthy with diabetes and following their dreams in life, not letting diabetes hold them back. I am going to read you Rachel's bio and we are going to get right into her story. So Rachel was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at the age of 7 after spending years working towards and landing her dream job, which is in quotation marks, as an attorney. She quickly discovered this isn't for me. It didn't take much soul searching for Rachel to realize that her true passion was the very same thing she spent hours thinking about each day, diabetes. Rachel now manages content, communications, and customer success at OneDrop. OneDrop's mission is to make managing diabetes an integrated part of your lifestyle, something that empowers, motivates, and keeps you mindful. This fall, OneDrop is launching a beautiful blood glucose monitoring system and monthly subscription service to provide access to diabetes supplies and support at a price anyone can afford. We are all in this together. And I love that because I say that all the time. So Rachel, thank you for taking the time to join us today. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm very excited to have you here. So as we always want to know, you know, where did the journey with diabetes start for you? What was your story of diagnosis like? And kind of what was the path that you traveled from then until now? Okay. So, I mean, for me, it starts when I was seven years old. So I don't remember all the specifics of the diagnosis. I remember not feeling well, I'd lost some weight, other people had, you know, my family members had noticed that I wasn't really my normal self. And then one day I remember being in the playground, I just kind of dropped to my knees and said, you know, I'm not feeling well, something's not right. So my mom picked me up from school, we went to the doctor, they checked my blood glucose and I was 900. So it was pretty clear at that point that I had diabetes. I don't think they did A1C that diagnosis right then, but I'm sure mine was sky high, and um, that was it. I started on two units of insulin in the morning and two units at night, and uh, you know, ever since then, I've been checking my blood glucose and uh, taking insulin daily. <laughs> yeah, life, you know. <laughs> so one of the things I like to ask here is, uh, obviously, at seven years old, and and you've lived a life up until now. Would you say that there were any particular parts of living a life with diabetes growing up and then teenage life and now obviously as an adult, was there anything that you struggled with um, more than anything else and then maybe something that you've overcome or thing, lessons that you've learned that you think are kind of pertinent um, to know? Definitely. I think growing up and I mean even through college, like my number one priority was always proving that diabetes wasn't going to change my life at all. So it was something that I just, I, I put living life before taking care of diabetes. And in most ways, this was a great thing because I just didn't even let it enter my mind in terms of it being something that would, you know, stop me from joining the track team or stop me from going to law school or stop me from pursuing whatever I wanted to do. But at the same time, it was something that prevented me from really engaging and I think taking as good control of my blood glucose as I could have. You know, I just, we could have, I would just like, you know, bolus and go for it and eat whatever I wanted and do whatever I wanted. And it led to like a lot of ups and downs and certainly some scary moments and looking back on it and obviously I'm older now and more mature and, and more capable of understanding the consequences of my actions. But at the time, I think I could have you know, been a little bit smarter about my decisions and taking, I don't know, just being more engaged in managing my blood glucose. And back, I, I didn't have a CGM back then. I didn't have a lot of these new tools that people are using now. So it was, it was just a totally different story. And I think that for kids, it's hard because you want to be just like everybody else and you don't want to be the kid with the problem or the disease or, you know, yeah. the kid who can't go to the sleepover. Like I just... I wanted to be like everybody else. And so I think as I've gotten older, I realized there's a lot of cool stuff about just being me. And diabetes is something that makes me unique. And I do see it as something very empowering. It's like quantified self and all these fitness trackers, like they're all the rage right now. And it's like, hey, I've been doing this my whole life. <laughs> like mm -hmm. way ahead of the curve here. I've been monitoring my blood glucose and paying attention to what I'm eating and monitoring my activity like since I can remember. So I have more embrace the actual management and day-to-day -day activities of having diabetes um, than I did before. Yeah, I think you bring up a really good point and something that certainly I struggled with and that I imagine that everybody does regardless of whether you have diabetes, which is 
that you don't want to be the outcast, so to speak, or someone who has something wrong with them or however it's perceived, especially when you're a child, because it's a little bit more uh, in your face where you're just involved with a lot of groups and other children all the time. But you come to the realization at a certain point where it's like, wait a minute, diabetes is part of my life, you know, and that's okay, actually has helped me, like you said, become awesome at tracking my statistics. Like I know my health, I know my body better than most people ever will, because I have to, but at the same time, it's actually like a blessing in disguise to have that ability to be so in touch with, and what I would call being mindful of, uh, which I know that One Drop is very, um, they promote that a lot because to be mindful of what the signs that your body is sending you becomes something that's not so much of a choice when you have diabetes. It's like, oh, I feel horrible. My blood sugar is high. I can't function. Oh, my blood sugar is low. I actually can't even stand up. Like you can't not be mindful of that. So it's almost like a forced mindfulness. But then over time, it gives you, I believe, an advantageous position over people who don't necessarily listen to the signs their body is sending them. So that's a really good point there. But I really want to hear about which I think is awesome. And, and you're not the first person who I've spoken to, had the pleasure of speaking to, who's had this situation occur, which is you thought you had your dream job of being, I guess, a lawyer, an attorney, and then realized that that wasn't your dream job. And now you're working in diabetes, in the diabetes space. And that's what, like you're saying, very fulfilling for you. Give me a little bit more detailed background on how that progressed. Well, I think part of, uh, you know, just becoming an adult, you care more about your health and, and you're planning more for your future. And I mean, working as an attorney, it, it was interesting. I found it really intellectually challenging and I, I felt engaged in my work every day, but it just felt like ha dealing with diabetes was something that I had to find time for and had to kind of weave into my, my day in other ways. Um, and I wanted to do something that was just more connected with health and, you know, my day-to-day -day experience. Like, I read about diabetes research in my spare time. Like, I subscribed to all the ADA journals. I, who does? Like, it was, it was just weird. And that's, this is what I was spending my free time doing. And then, you know, the other 18 hours of the day I was working. <laughs> like, I just, I really wanted to feel like, I was taking a more holistic approach to my life and not really compartmentalizing it as much. And I felt that I could do a lot of great work in diabetes because I've had it for so long. I can relate to pretty much anything somebody talks about related to diet, like fear of complications, dealing with the day-to-day -day ups and downs, balancing you know your work life and your personal life and, and having diabetes. It, it's a lot. And I, I thought, I just want to find a way to interact with other people on a regular basis who are going through the same things and and somehow help other people achieve the same, I guess, mindfulness around diabetes that I, I had suddenly started to feel. You know, I, I'd, I'd focused so much on my career and my education up until that point. And at, at, I don't know, I guess, uh, let's say five years ago, I realized I really just wanted to bring everything together and I wanted diabetes to be this like central, this focal point for me because it, it was just something that, it drove me more than anything else. It was like this, this independent driver of everything I did and, um, and everything else kind of fell into place behind it. Yeah, so, but for me, what I wanna know and probably other people out there because I do a lot of work in the diabetes space but I also do a lot of work in the entrepreneurial space. I'm very um, business oriented, I've always been that way. Um, so for me, the idea of spending the amount of time that you obviously had to spend in school to become an attorney and all of the studying and the bar exams, and obviously you were already working in the industry. What was the catalyst? Like, that were you, Was there a day where you just said, you know what, I'm not doing this anymore, and you just stopped? Or was there a transition? Like, I know you're working with OneDrop now. Like, was that the catalyst, or how did it exactly go down? Because to make that decision is huge. To say, I've dedicated this past whatever many years of my life, eight, whatever, you know, studying and learning and apprenticing and whatever. I don't know what attorneys have to do because I've never been there, but it's a lot of work. So to say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop doing that 
for now and, and move on to something else. That's something that would scare the living hell out of most people. How did you handle that? It, you know, it wasn't like it was just one day suddenly I, I had this epiphany and I knew I had to do this. It was just the deeper I got into being an attorney, the more I realized I didn't necessarily want to be a partner in nine years. I didn't necessarily want my boss's job. Um, I wanted to do something where I was interacting more directly with people who were kind of like me, dealing with health issues and trying to figure out life and something that was just more relatable to me and not just an intellectual pursuit, but you know, an emotional one, a, a more fulfilling one. Um, so there wasn't, there wasn't some one moment where I was just like, I can't take this anymore. I've been sitting in this you know, room with no windows doing document review for the past 10 hours and I'm gonna tear my hair out if I don't leave. <laughs> um, I did like my job. I liked who I was working with. I liked what I was doing. Just something about it just felt incomplete. Yeah. And you know, the opportunity to work at one job and with Jeff presented itself. I saw that um, you know, TechCrunch broke the news of OneDrop's funding, and I saw this video where Jeff was talking about his approach to diabetes management and how he saw the future of diabetes self-care, and it just moved me. I saw that, and I thought, this is somebody who's really got the same kind of idea that, that I have. Like, you can take care of yourself. You don't need to feel like a victim. This is something that really should be empowering and motivating and a driver of health in your life. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a that's excellent point because I think that as we go on our journeys, it's normal for us to end up finding, whether it's randomly or not, however you want to view it, the people that we need to be in contact with. But it's just the way that kind of like when the student is ready, the teacher will appear type thing. It's not necessarily a student teacher relationship all the time, but it's just the right person ends up coming into your life for some reason. And that's kind of how it always happens. But that brings me back to kind of my, my next question, which is, so for me, I'm a huge promoter of peer to peer support in the diabetes community, particular in any health space, disease space. Uh, I believe that peer to peer support, meaning just having regular interactions, whether it's in person, on the phone, via video chat, with other people that live with diabetes. Again, not an expert, not a doctor, not an endocrinologist, not a certified diabetes educator, although if those people were your peers, of course they're included too, but really just another human being who lives with the disease or someone who loves and cares for us who can provide an empathetic ear, who can not necessarily fix anything, but you can tell this person about the experiences that you've had and you don't need to give it any more explanation because they actually get it. I have found with working with hundreds and even at this point, probably thousands of people, people over the last seven years, that that is what I have found to be the missing link in our desire to feel more involved and wanting to do the things that we need to do to stay healthy, like checking our blood sugar more often or, you know, pre-bolusing for meals or whatever the case may be. It's, we feel like we're part of a team versus like, I'm just doing all the same stuff over and over again every day and nobody gets it. That can change someone's life in an instant. And I know this from personal experience and because I've watched it happen so many times. And I hear you continuing to say you wanted to be involved with more people that were like you. And I think that's a natural draw that people do end up getting. Um, so did you know other people with diabetes? Like, did you go to diabetes camp or was this transition into working with one drop in the diabetes community in that, um, in that aspect, your first kind of regular interaction with other people with diabetes? So my story is a little interesting. I agree 100% that having peer support is essential. I think that part of what enabled me to do the things I wanted to do and feel empowered even growing up and never feeling like diabetes would hold me back is because I was diagnosed within a year of my best friend. I, I had known her since I was three and she was diagnosed at six, I was diagnosed at seven, and we just, you know, we went through it together the whole time. And it wasn't until I graduated high school and off to college that I was on my own. And so I knew what it was like to have that support system. It was like, she, she and I were always together, our families were always around us, like, we had one other friend, we're all still close, and 
our, the third friend was the weird one because she didn't have diabetes. So, so she had to like learn about everything, kind of like, you know, sit around and wait while we were checking our blood sugars and like doing our pump stuff. And, our, and I never felt like the odd one out in my immediate social circle or even like at family events or anything because um, this friend was always there. So I knew what it was like to have all that support. And it wasn't until I was out on my own that it wasn't you know, as constant. I mean, we'd still, I remember being in law school and like my, that was a difficult transition transition and my blood sugars were definitely not as well controlled as I wanted them to be. And I'd call her, I'm like, hey, your blood glucose is like over 200 every day because this is happening to me. Like, how do you deal with this? And she's like, oh yeah, you know, I get it. Sometimes that happens. And we're just like having this back and forth discussion and like trying to figure out ways to tackle this issue that I'm having. And I had someone that I could just call up and ask that question to. And, um, I realize a lot of people don't have that, and that that's terrible. Everybody should have that buddy that they can just call up, and and you know, even if they're not getting advice or you can't really figure out the problems together, you're commiserating. You're like, you know, yeah, this is not the most fun thing to deal with in the world, but hey, let's let's get through it. You'll be fine. Like, believe me, it'll work out. Um, and so we were always that source of support for each other. So then, fast forward, you know, I, here I am. I guess like seven years into not having that constant connection to somebody with diabetes, like that day-to-day -day interaction, and it, 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 that's what was missing. I think you know that's and and I knew what it felt like to have it, and I just wanted to get back into that. I wanted to feel that kind of involvement and support and connection to other people with diabetes again. Yeah. And I, I love that. And I, I remember actually Rachel and I have spoken one other time and, and she did tell me that story and I, I actually forgot and I'm glad because I totally forgot and it's a great story. Um, that is what I would call just, a, I don't even know what I'd call it, like just some universal blessing that, that you know, because most people that I talk to don't have that. And the fact is that you didn't take it for granted. It wasn't like you were like, oh, I know this other, like you guys depended on each other, you leaned on each other and you still have a great relationship. So you kind of had your peer to peer support built in. And I would venture to guess that that was a major factor in your attitude that you say that you have and you still had and still have of saying, I'm not gonna let diabetes stop me from doing things because your friend, you see your friend, she's doing things. So why would I stop doing things? And I think that's just so, incredibly valuable and um, it makes me happy to know that you have that and that now you've been um, kind of propelled in back into the space so you can continue doing that for other people. Um, so tell me a little bit about what do you do at OneDrop? So I know I read that you're, you know, content communications and customer success. So that has, that can cover a lot of things. So tell me a little bit about what you do there and how you get to interact with the diabetes community on a regular basis. So, I mean, a major thing on the content front is education. So we want to put together educational materials that are easy to digest and explain complicated issues that everybody with diabetes faces um, in a way that they can, you know, consume in a couple minutes and then they've got that information with them and can use that to make better decisions about their day-to-day -day, uh, diabetes management. So, for example, we took a topic like A1C and broke it down because you know A1C it's got to be below seven and you know in order to be considered in, in proper range and you know, ideally you're between four and six if you don't have diabetes but like what is, what does that number really mean why is A1C uh, representative of your average blood glucose how does that work in your body what is hemoglobin what does dedicated <laughs> hemoglobin mean so we took all of this stuff and broke it down in an infographic that I think is really uh, simple and easy to understand and that that's our goal to take complicated topics like a1c like um, glycemic variability like eating low carb even and just breaking it down into di digestible snippets and and helping people to tackle all of these difficult things um, without going to the doctor you know just you're sitting at home you're on your phone and you're just able to like zip through this infographic and learn everything you need to know about A1C or your, your blood glucose levels and you know and how to interpret your data and when you think about all the data we need to interpret regularly as people with diabetes it's insane yes. it's you know not everybody likes doing math you no. know? and you have no choice if you have diabetes so I think anything that helps break down all this complicated math and science and makes it accessible to people with diabetes 
no matter where they are on the spectrum in terms of you know liking math or hating it, uh, it it's better. And, and there's not enough of that out there. So that's a major, major th thing we're doing on the content front. Um, in terms of communications, I mean, I'm on social media. I'm um, posting blogs. We have a news feed within the OneDrop app where we pull our users so that they can interact and see they can say talk about how they're feeling, but also see how other people are dealing with issues in the diabetes community. And like you said, a lot of people don't have that peer support. They're they they've been dealing with this on their own for many many years, and then to have to like go into a poll, respond like, okay, yeah, I change my landset, you know, every day, and see that you know there are some of us out there who change the landset like once a year. <laughs> it's yeah. it's interesting, and and it just shows you like, hey, you're not alone. There are other people out there who are also changing landsets, and, and this is kind of a nice thing. It's part of. Part of making diabetes a more livable experience is knowing that there are other people living through it too. Yeah, absolutely. You're not and um, uh, and customer, customer success, I mean, if you uh, email OneDrop and you have an issue, I'm the one who's <laughs> responding. Nice. <laughs> Work through it. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I'm doing at OneDrop right now. Cool. And so these infographics, with, which sounds super valuable and, and like really important for people to know and be able to look at, and I think the more easily digestible content that is put out there for, that's easily accessible for people to get to, like you said, is super important and also part of the learning and growing process. I mean, I'm going to, like I always do, I'm going to post all the links that Rachel has uh, to get more information about OneDrop and follow and Twitter and all that other stuff. But where can we find these infographics just so in, in case people do want to scroll down below the video, what, where would they go to find these infographics and all this information? So you just go to onedrop.today and check out our blog, search for infographics, and you'll they'll all come up. We've got infographics on tons of topics from how to exercise, um, the benefits of walking on diabetes management, A1C, type 2 diabetes medications, what exactly it means to have diabetes, what's different about digestion, and um, you know what what is it exactly that we're working on fixing when we take insulin or other diabetes med medications, what is it that's happening in the digestive system that's requiring this additional help? Um, gosh, uh, you have ways to treat yourself that aren't food. Yeah, that's important. <laughs> how to eat low carb during the holidays, how to handle the holidays in general, and we're constantly pumping out new content there. And it's I just, and if people have suggestions, email us. Let us know what kinds of things you want to know about because we want to be responsive to the community. I'm, we're putting out infographics now based on topics I've had issues with before that my friends have had issues with before. But we obviously want to know what the community needs help with. Like, what, where are the gaps? Like, you learn a lot when you go to the doctor's office when you sit with your CDE, but that's only happening like what, once a year, you know, maybe once every six months. What, do you want more information about and that you like, maybe forgot to ask your doctor? What's something you're, you're back home, you've got all this advice on how to adjust your pump basal rates, how to you know, change your, how to carb count differently. What, what was missing? Yeah. And, and what would be a handy tool for you to have at your disposal day to day to help you get through all of these you know, difficult problems that we all face? Absolutely. And what I love about that is that, I mean, so I'm, again, in the entrepreneurial space and I love to hear that when companies are are very focused on what the what the com community wants because to me like what I do is like if I'm not listening to what everybody wants to hear then what am I doing in the first place and I think that I think that all businesses should kind of focus their um their their energies on that because any business that's in business is only in business because of the pe people who frequent you know their business or their site or anything like that so I'm super happy to hear that OneDrop is so open to hearing from the community, and I hope that people will write in and, and let you know about things that they want to hear, because I think that'll be really valuable feedback to have. Um, so as far as it goes with OneDrop, uh, give me a little bit more information. I know I read that it's coming out in the fall, and so this, is, this interview is actually happening in the beginning of September of 2016, um, but it may not get released for a few weeks or even a month. With that in mind, when can we look for OneDrop? What's the process gonna be like with that? So uh, we're planning to start shipping OneDrop meter kits, which are these things. Cool. And if you haven't seen it yet, here's the OneDrop meter. 
and uh, our very fancy lancing device. Very fancy. I switched lancet here this morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's in a black vegan leather case. Um, this will be shipped starting in November. We'll be taking pre-orders before then. Um, uh, we're waiting on FDA approval, which should be in by the end of the month, and you know, if not sooner. And um, basically, go to the website, sign, give us your email address, and you'll be updated. Along with the meter kit, what you get if you subscribe to One Drop is unlimited test strips delivered to your door monthly. So based on your usage, we send you all the test strips you need. And on top of that, you get 24-7 on-demand access to a certified diabetes educator to answer any questions you might have um, you know, along the way. You know, what, what should I be eating for dinner? What, how often should I be checking my blood glucose? Is, is, is exercising at this time okay? I'm going to prom, how do you think I should handle this? I just drank six beers and <laughs> what should I do? I, like basically anything, anything yeah. you can think of. Um, that person is there to kind of help you through and to teach you skills that you really need to to manage diabetes for the long haul because it's like sure you could say I'm never gonna eat any carbs again and I'm never gonna do this I'm just gonna be like a perfect compliant diabetic for you know however but this stuff doesn't last you need to know how to adapt to different situations life changes you get a new job you get pregnant you get married you get divorced you get fired like how do you deal with all of these things diabetes is it's it's a constant learning experience and as these things happen you need help and one drop is there for you that's exciting i was gonna say having 24 7 access to a certified diabetes educator i think is a pretty valuable um tool to have in your tool belt, so to speak. So that's pretty exciting. I mean, obviously having a flat rate for test strips is also exciting, especially for a lot of people who may not have insurance or what have you. That's also highly valuable. But I think that that's exciting that you will have the access to someone that can actually answer your questions. And 24-7, that's, I think, alone is a big deal. So it's yeah. pretty cool. I mean, our CDEs do have to sleep sometimes. So. Yeah. I was going to say, I mean, as, a di as someone who works as a coach, a um, health coach, a diabetes coach, personal trainer, and I do my training and coaching virtually, you know, when someone works with me, I tell them they have access to me all the time. But like you say, I sleep. Like, so if I'm sleeping and someone emails me, of course, I'm not going to be able to get back to you until I wake up. So that's, um, I was going to say, it's good to have a network of people to be able to. Yeah, and we do. Share. And, and yeah as near time as we possibly can yeah. so yeah, well it's not just one person <laughs> on the other end there are quite a few and they'll be answering the questions as they come in as soon as possible that's awesome sweet I love it um, so if you were to be asked what you're going to be um, over the years you've obviously learned a lot uh, with living with diabetes and now working in uh, the field of kind of diabetes uh, innovation, your technological innovation, making sleeker, cooler, you know, more functional meters and things like that. What would you say are Rachel's top three tips for living happy and healthy with diabetes that work for you? Um, I'd say number one is you have to figure out the system that works for you. I was on an insulin pump for 16 years and, you know, I was convinced that it was the only way to manage diabetes well. But it caused me so much frustration with like kinked catheters and just like no delivery alarms and other like random alarms for whatever reason, blood glucose reminders and all these things that like I don't really need. And um, you know, they've come out with all these great new basal insulins that didn't exist way back when I, I mm -hmm. started off the insulin pump and it actually was the best option back then. Um, but yeah, now I take Traceba and I'm on injections and I love it. I'm having like the best blood glucose numbers ever. I wear a Dexcom too, which is awesome. I can't say how much it's changed in my life. Um, but finding just the gear that works for you is really important. So, you know, I would encourage everybody to ask as many questions as they, as they possibly can, wear different devices if they can, if you can get access to different kinds of pumps and just test them out in real life, like take them home do it because it's something that's it's 
it's every day and you really need to make sure that you feel comfortable with what you're wearing. Yeah. And for me, you know, I, I wore a pump with tubing and then I switched to the, the Omnipod, which is like another awesome thing. And the biggest thing for me was like not having to disconnect before taking a shower, being able to like walk around naked. Yeah. <laughs> it was this huge thing. It was like a total revelation. Like, this is this is amazing. Why aren't more people wearing this kind of pump? And is that for me the, the disconnected lifestyle was just much more conducive to better diabetes management and now and I, I know that I like I like to be sure that when I inject insulin it's in there and I love the confidence that I have now just using insulin pens um, so there's that basically in short MDI may be better for you than an insulin pump <laughs> so sure. that's one major thing and um, another thing I've learned is uh, eating low carb is not as hard as you think. And it really does make having diabetes so much more manageable. When you don't have to worry about a huge blood, glu blood glucose spike after every meal, and then you know the following like, after you rage bolus because you're 300 and then you're like 30 in <laughs> two hours. You don't have to deal with any of these like huge swings. And it just makes life so much more livable. I feel so much less burnout and frustration day to day now that I've really made diet and then also exercise part of my diabetes management. I think growing up I was really resistant to the idea that I had to eat a certain way or that I had to exercise in a certain way or that all these other requirements were being put on me. I just like, didn't want to deal with it. And now that I've, I've embraced all of these things, it's like, I wish I'd done it sooner. It's it, life is just so much simpler now. Yeah, I think that those are ridiculously good points that I, you know, I kind of preach these things that you're saying all the time about first off finding what works for you um, because I had a similar experience except in the opposite direction where you know I went 22 years with manual daily injections and then switch to an Omnipod simply because I wanted to try it. it. There was no force or anything, but just like you, I was like, well. I have pretty decent control now. Let me see if trying a pump would work well for me. And I said, worst case scenario, I'll just go back to manual di manual injections and no big deal. And so that now I've been on the Omnipod for three years. I've never tried a pump with tubing because for me, that doesn't appeal to me. It doesn't, I know that won't work for me because I don't even like the idea of it. So of course, if I don't even like the idea of it, then it won't work. But I like the idea of the tubeless pump. And for now, the past three years, now, and now I'm to my 25th year this this actually this month i you know i don't necessarily miss injecting and for other reasons that you know you like it and i know tons of people who are on manual injections that love it and have great success and and you can um but the whole point of that is that what's going to work for you is not necessarily going to work for me and so on and so on so it is up to us to figure out what tools work best and make us feel most empowered and confident and the same thing goes with nutrition and exercise, I had to find the eating lifestyle that worked for me. I had to find the exercise regimen that worked for me. It took years, but now I finally took the time and figured it out and more than anything else, admitted and embraced the fact that I was worth the time it took to figure these things out. And it was really important for my own well-being to do so. So I think that those are such great tips. So, um, so I know those are great all alone, and, and I'd love to hear a third one if you have it. If not, it's okay, just because those are so amazing. I, I do have a third one, and it's, you know, whatever feelings you have uh, that are, you know, any guilty feelings or blame or shame you have around diabetes, I, I, I don't know how to make people feel them less. I would always feel so guilty if because of my dietary needs, we needed to go to a different restaurant or do anything differently, or let's say I forgot something at home, like my meter, everybody had to you know, pause while I went and took care of my stuff. Um, you know, life is tough if you've got diabetes and just don't feel guilty about it, it's not your fault. And people, your friends, your family, they don't really mind, they love you anyway. They're okay with eating low carb for you. And they will do it because they want you to be happy and feel comfortable when you're all together. So, and yeah, I think about it also, it's kind of crazy to think, oh my gosh, I have to eat low carb. It's such a burden to everybody around me because they all want to go out for burgers and fries and like I can't really eat anything there. 
but it's it's not a big deal. People, you know, eat gluten free. There are people who are vegetarian. There are people who like have all sorts of other constraints. They're lactose intolerant and they're not ashamed of it. So why are people with diabetes always feeling guilty about, you know, their their special needs or their, you know, and anything that might interfere with with normal life? It's like I, I didn't say that in the best way, but I just, I wish there were a way to help everybody realize, and I think part of it is the whole peer-to-peer -peer mentorship stuff, realizing that you're not alone and there are other folks who are dealing with this, but um, just not feeling any more guilt and shame around having diabetes. It, it's who you are, it's part of you, and for me, it's been a wonderful thing because it's, it, like you said, it's made me more mindful about my health and my body, I'm more in tune and I'm really focused on being healthy and fit for the rest of my life. And I, I'm glad that I made the necessary changes to get there in my mid-20s as opposed to, like, in my 40s or, you know, when other people usually finally come around to that. Yeah. Like, it's been, a, you know, top of mind for me forever, and I'm grateful for that. Yeah, and I yeah. – A little along the way. Yeah. yeah, I totally agree. And for me, and I want to – I kind of want to add on something to the whole – feeling the shame and anxiety and all the other things because I dealt with that to a very extreme uh, level for many years of my life. And one of the ways that I learned to get past that and to not feel that way anymore, especially if it has to do with like, like you said, like going out to eat and forgetting something at home or something like that, because I can't tell you how many times that's happened to me over the last 25 years. I mean, not a ton, but enough that of course it's going to happen. We're human. And the thing that I think of most is no matter who I'm with, I would think to myself one question. And that question would be, would I care if the situation were reversed and this other person was needing to go back and they had to wait for me and the answer, or I had to wait for them. And the answer is, always, of course I wouldn't. I, I want them to be healthy. I, whatever they need to do, no problem. And then I think, why wouldn't I deserve that same um, common courtesy or what have you? Like if you love someone and you care about them, of course you want them to, you know they're going to sometimes forget things and it's not a big deal. So I ask the question, would I mind if the situation were reversed? And the answer is always no. And so I'm like, okay, well then why do I think they care? And they don't. It's just a thing that we tell ourselves. So it's, you got to get out of the, the habit. I think. Got it. it requires some rewiring, but once you get there, it's so much better. And the craziest thing is, I feel like I also forget things less now that I'm more aware of it, you know? Oh, yeah. Like, Certainly. I'm just, I've got these systems. My husband is also, like, he's my backup. I, I, I've got my checklist, and then it's also on him. Like, he's, he's, my, he's supposed to support me and help me, and he's like, hey, do you, do you have everything you need? Let's go through the checklist and make sure. And, you know, in the past, I would have felt really guilty asking somebody else to help me out. But now I realize it's, it's not a big ask. Yeah. It's really small. And you know, the people who love you and who care about you are more than willing to do these things with you. Yeah, I, I agree with you with that, too. I'm very lucky as well. I realized to have a husband who, I mean, at this point, I don't necessarily have a checklist. But if we are going away on vacation, then he'll be like, okay, you have everything you need, right? Like, just because, uh, you know, there have been several times over the 10 years that we've been together that, um, there have been, you know, emergency stops at the pharmacy to buy over-the-counter insulin that no longer actually works, like having to buy a bottle of R like a couple of years ago, because you can't actually purchase Humalog or Novolog, or at least where I live, without a prescription, but you can buy R, which like barely works, but like, you know, just like Christmas time, like trying to find a Rite Aid in the middle of Center City, Philadelphia, because we're trying to go to a Christmas party because I forgot my insulin. It's like, okay, it's okay. It's going to be okay, because if this happened to my husband, I would do the same thing and I wouldn't care. And it's the same, like you said, it's like, we need other people. The like, diabetes is not like an island to be lived on. We need like other people to come live on this island with us so that we can have that support system. It's not weakness. It's strength to actually admit that you need that support and that you can learn and grow and do it with the people that you love. So I think that those are extremely valid uh, and amazingly well put tips that you have learned over the years. So that's good. Um, anything else that you would like to add before we wrap things up here? Um, you know, I think I pretty much said everything in those last three tips, but you know, if you want to know more about one drop and what we're doing to build more of a community around diabetes and have this worldwide support system, not just between people and say the CDEs, but also just other people with diabetes. OneDrop is a sharing platform. 
We share all of our data. We're trying to figure out you know, best practices and solutions for people with diabetes by pulling everybody together and having everybody work together towards better diabetes management. Nobody's alone in this, no matter where you are, even if you don't have friends with diabetes that you have access to face to face, like this is a, it's a mobile platform. You've got access to other people with diabetes, no matter where you are. And, um, and also I really think people should get in, involved in the diabetes online community and put yourself out there. Don't be afraid to put yourself out there and say, I have diabetes and get involved and seek the support and the community that all of us really do need. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I, I You say so many things that I say all the time, but just to reiterate, I always say that we need the peer-to-peer -peer support. However, it's not, most likely, it's not just going to fall into our laps. It's not just gonna be like one day, like, oh, look, here's a friend with diabetes that just showed up on my doorstep. You actually have to take different actions, meaning put, like you said, put yourself out there, go into Facebook groups, go into online chat rooms like 2diabetes.org, sign up for uh, local chapter meetings of like JDRF or Diabetes Sisters for Women. These are all, you know, well-respected organizations that have meetings and all these other things like, but you have to take the initiative. And that is often, I think, for a lot of people, the most difficult step in finding the support that we need. But once you take it, it's like, how did I live without this for so long? Like kicking yourself for not doing it sooner. So be proactive, go out there and, and put yourself out there. Like you said, exactly. So cool. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down with us today. As always, I will link to all of Rachel's links right underneath the video. So you can go down and check out more about OneDrop. Just scroll down. If you found this video valuable and you enjoyed our conversation, please give us a thumbs up. Feel free to subscribe for more interviews and other nutrition and mindset videos on a regular basis. And as always, thank you for joining us. And we will see you on the next episode of Unleash Your Inner Diabetes Dominator. Bye, guys.